We acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The way I describe holistic management is being as soft as possible on your land and working with nature. We use grazing animals to look after the soils, to look after the plants, and that's the key. The, the animals are a tool that we use for landscape management. By resting the country and using the livestock in the manner that we do, it's given nature a chance to, to rebalance itself. This is the Big Shift for Small Farms podcast. G'day listeners, I'm your host Edgar Grestet. In this episode, we're looking at holistic land management and how you shift the way you think about your farm business. Why do you farm the way you do? In this episode, we'll hear from farmers who through personal illness and tragedy have been forced to reimagine their farming values and practices. And we'll hear who's leading the way in holistic land management, all to help you make the big shift. the paddock between your ears that you've got to change first. That's Brian Welberg. He's a farmer and educator teaching holistic land management. The name of his company is Inside Outside Management and the story behind the name says a lot about the way he approaches farming education. It just sang to us because you know it's really about what's inside your head and that then affects what's outside in the paddock. Born and bred in Zimbabwe, Brian now calls Australia home. As an educator, he's certified with the Savory Institute, which teaches farmers to manage their land holistically. Now, holistic is another word for integrated or comprehensive, but the general idea is to take a broader perspective when managing landscapes. For Brian, a big part of his workshops is getting farmers to shift their mindset and rethink their practices. One of the key concepts behind holistic management is, is accepting that change is the norm. And normally with training, we'll spend you know, the first couple of hours or so just looking at our current paradigms or way we think, because that'll obviously dictate how we manage, and getting people with comfortable of thinking, well, actually, maybe there is another way. And then often it's really easy for them to go back to their patch, and whether it's a vegetable patch, a, a lawn in the garden, or a paddock, or a you know, huge property, um, being able to implement and, and actually see change for themselves. And, and, and you know, once, once you become observant, you can see that change extremely quickly, literally after a day. And that then provides the energy where people become really excited about this because, hold on, here is a way forward for a lot of the problems we're seeing all around the world today. Listeners who haven't done a holistic management course or anything like that, are there any experiences that you had on those farms during that course that were memorable at all? Every farm we went to, Brian would bring out his penetrometer where their chickens had been, like pasture-raised meat birds or egg layers, and we'd put the penetrometer into the soil in an area on a laneway or, or somewhere else in the paddock, and you'd sort of feel the force that that penetrometer goes down with into the soil and then you'd go to where the chickens had just been and you'd put the penetrometer down and every single time on every different farm in every different area that penetrometer would just go straight down to the ground and just seeing the powerful impact that moving these chickens around your paddocks can have on your soil was just amazing. That's Virginia Moore from Grace Springs Farm in the central coast of New South Wales. So we're just a tiny farm. We're only 26 acres here and we're producing beef, chicken meat, duck meat, duck eggs, chicken eggs, honey and a little bit of veg um, and we do dairy for our own use and we also run agritourism. So we do workshops, tours and school excursions. It will be 15 years ago now, our son was three and was diagnosed with leukaemia and I wanted to know why there was such a high risk of children being diagnosed with leukaemia in Australia. And as we started looking at the things that have changed so drastically in the last 50, 60 years, it really came back for us to not just what we're eating, but actually how our food is being farmed. Well, we were growing all our own food in Sydney, um, in our backyard as much as we could, and we started farming the next door neighbour's block. 
and I came across some of Alan Savory's work and Joel Salatin from Polyface Farms and had the opportunity to hear Joel speak here in Australia back at that time, I think that was 2012. It was farming that you could start without a great deal of money and infrastructure. So we could actually give it a go without having to put too much money in it up front. For Virginia, holistic management also gave her a new way to imagine and understand the science behind agriculture. I started an environmental science degree at university and for me everything was being taught in set subjects and none of those subjects referred to each other. Whereas in holistic management, each part of that whole that you're working on all works with and for and, and is part of the next part of what you're doing. And to me, just managing things as a whole and considering all the different aspects of your farming or of your life or of your relationships is incredibly powerful. There's a lot of sort of just stepping back, looking at things, a lot of thinking rather than just acting, especially for us, just sort of thinking what would normally happen in nature? Because so much of what Alan Savory's done with holistic management is based on mimicry of, of how the, you know, the different animals migrated through South Africa and, and through America. And just stopping and, and sort of thinking, well, hang on, what would normally happen in nature? If I wasn't here, if I was out of the picture, if my management wasn't wrong, what would normally happen here? And then be able to sort of sit and come back in and make decisions that way. It does take a little bit of discipline because sometimes you do sort of want to go in and just fix things up. But the first question we sort of ask ourselves here when things aren't going to plan is, is what's, what's my part in this? What have I done wrong here? Because nature's pretty good at keeping things going. Often it's how we're managing things that causes a problem. For many farmers, daily life is often about problem solving and reacting to these challenges. But the way holistic management teaches us to approach the situation is by referring to what's called a holistic context which is basically a vision for the future that guides our decision-making processes. And it's one of the first things Brian asks farmers during field days. This is your land. You've had a lot of money for it, I should imagine. How do you want it to look? Our decisions are driven by vision. You know, self-visualisation today, if you look at sport, that's what it's about. You know, when Johnny Wilkinson's standing there with his thumbs doing this, looking at the goalpost, what's he doing? He's picturing success. Okay? And that's the deal, is if you have a vision of this land as being soft and vibrant and full of life and covered and productive, you'll start making decisions towards that. So the holistic context is basically where you're writing out what you want your life to look like and the different things that you're going to have to have in place to be able to achieve that. For us, an example would be that we want to be surrounded by fertile, lush pastures. And that basically is a statement then that we can make decisions based off moving forward. So deciding what we do on our farm, we come back to will it help us achieve having fertile, lush pastures. If it's a no, then we don't go ahead with it. If it's a yes, then that's something that we're able to pursue and look into a bit further. What we start by doing is just talking about all the things that are important to you, so your values and different words, and then you start to build together this context of of how you want your life to look further down the track. So it's not a set of goals, it's not something to achieve, it's something to just constantly be making decisions against and, and working toward within your life. Has that made it much easier for you to make decisions around business, always being able to refer back to that context? The context combined with the holistic management decision-making tools. So there's actually a framework that helps you make decisions and you refer that back to your context. And those two things together are very powerful in helping to make decisions. I find decisions personally very difficult and I will mull over them back and forward for a very long time. But the holistic management decision-making framework gives you, I think it's a set of seven questions that you can work through just to help guide you in moving forward on those decisions. And it really does get things happening a lot quicker. The core of holistic management is good decision making. Because as humans, productivity. We'll fix the environment later, we'll fix up the family later. As long as I'm making money, it's good. Yeah? And, and it's, it's coming back to bite us. We really need to be more holistic in everything we do. So when it comes to managing your land and your business holistically, having a context and a framework of questions is key to making good decisions. But what gets farmers to shift to this different way of managing holistically? 
that paradigm shift that Brian spoke of earlier. For many farmers, it's a life-changing aha moment, and quite often it's directly related to their health. Like for this farmer, Martin Royds. At university, learned about soil structure and all that. I thought the chemical process was fantastic. I didn't have to plough the soil. I could spray it, sow it within hours afterwards. But one day I came back from spraying and I'd blown up like a Michelin man. I just had welts and all over me. It was not a pretty sight. I thought, maybe I'm poisoning myself. And then I thought a bit more about it, that I was poisoning the grass, the soil, and my animals. I'd actually developed techniques where, say, thistles, you can spray a whole lot of chemicals on there and just kill the flatweeds, or you can spray a very small amount and it changes the carbohydrates in the thistles to sugars. They stand up like that. You can put a big mob of sheep in there, get a good feed off them, and got rid of the thistles. Used 15% of the chemical that I normally used. I thought that was a great idea. So then those fat lambs went into the butcher shop and you ate them with that chemical in them. And that's when I went, maybe not such a good idea if you look at the whole. Now, 20 years later, after discovering holistic management, when you ask him what he farms, he's got a very different answer. I farm sunlight energy. And the best way of doing that is growing grass. And so I harvest sunlight energy with grass and turn that into soil carbon using cattle. So the main export that goes off the farm that gives me dollars is cattle. We've altered the Australian environment that we don't have the megafauna. People are not eating enough kangaroos to manage them effectively. So cows are the best animal to turn grass into a protein and to build soil carbon. Australia's got the best example of plants and systems to slow water down, to recycle it, to build soil carbon. And we can do that really quickly. And we can take carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into something productive by working with plants and animals. For Martin, this shift in thinking about his farming practices and the role it plays in the health of the planet means that he looks at every aspect of his property in a new and different way especially when it comes to native grasses and weeds. So before, yes, weeds were a plant out of, out of place. Now they're a messenger. You know, we've just gone through three years of extremely dry weather, some extremely hot weather, and then I've been burnt four times. So I know the weeds will come up there. They're coming up to say, you've really hammered this country and we're here to recover it. Different plants will tell you a different story of your previous management or the the way the land's been treated in the past. And I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm thinking, well, the land's been compacted, there's too much nitrogen in some areas, whatever, different plants will come up to cycle that, open the soil up, do their job, and then when their cycle's finished, I'll get back to the more desirable grasses that I want. I used to poison everything and plant fescue, phalaris, ryegrass, and then I've realised that they actually don't do very well in a really dry conditions. Uh, it was amazing when the fire came through a week afterwards. The grass was brown and dead before the fire. Extremely hot, hot dry conditions. Fire came through, a plant just came back and was this high in a week. And you're going, I don't know, still don't know what it is. It's a native form. A couple of ones came up. So they were trying to get back into the landscape and you know great fantastic so now we've got 80 different herbs and grasses that will grow at all the different times i've got grasses that grow in midwinter grass that grow in summer so there's always something there that the cattle can do well on along with rethinking weeds martin also looks at pests in a different way too preferencing a natural solution over a chemical one last summer i had a good cover of feed and then we had the grasshoppers come in and they just they ate the, the, the dead this um, dead material as well they got that hungry and that's why I've got those chooks down there is because I don't like spraying so I thought well I'll get 300 chooks and and we 
getting them in the caravans and then we're going to move them around. We just saw some another hatching of grasshoppers up there and we can chase them with the chooks. Now remember, Martin is not a chook farmer. He farms sunlight energy by growing plants and building soil carbon. His tools for the job are the animals, be they sheep, cattle or chooks. And how he uses them is by mimicking patterns in nature. Not only has it built resilience in the farm, it's also benefited his business by reducing his inputs. Another advocate of no input farming is sheep farmer and educator Colin Size. It is really simple. We just need to grow plants, plants and more plants. And we, we can often kickstart a, a degraded soil, and I get people to do this, by growing multi-species crops, like mixes of crops, up to 10 species in, in a crop, and then lay one on top of another in the summer and then the winter, and that'll restore soils. We don't need fertiliser to fix soils. We need to feed soil microbes. We don't need to add soil microbes. There's enough microbes there, we just need to feed them. And plants are the things that feed them. Colin's shift towards a focus on plants and native grasses was a sudden one back in 1979, when the entire family farm enterprise was virtually destroyed by a major bushfire. And it came in through from the northwest and burnt the whole farm. The fire just lit up the whole flat here, and the flames came through probably 30 feet high, 10 metres high, and we were caught in it, and I was burnt in it. I had, was burnt up the backs of the arms and had virtually no hair left. We lost 3,000 of our merino sheep killed in that fire. All the buildings were destroyed and all, virtually all the fencing was destroyed. So we had nothing left. It was just a blackened ruin. So how do you survive that? With no money to restock or grow a crop, Colin's only option was to go with nature. He watched as the native grasslands returned after the fire. And as business got back on its feet, he started to question his conventional use of herbicides on native grasses when he was direct drilling his winter crop. Why are we killing these native grasses when we knew that they were dormant in the winter? So there's no reason to kill them if we're planting a crop into them that's growing in the winter. And that's simply how natural systems work, how grasslands function. So we tried that just direct drilling crops, either wheat or oats or barley, any of those, into the grasslands without killing the native grasses. In those early days, we were using selective herbicides to control weeds but not kill the grasses. Now I've moved more, very much towards uh, sowing crops as much as possible without a herbicide at all. Colin now has a range of enterprises on the farm, including sheep and merino wool, pasture cropping, native seed harvesting, a kelpie breeding business and his consulting. And his key message to other farmers is that if you've got multiple enterprises on your farm property, they need to be working in harmony, both economically and ecologically. They only work well if they are financially and ecologically compatible, not be antagonistic to each other. And a way of describing that is that most of the wheat sheep farms, like traditional wheat sheep farms, do not function well together. And, and people think they do, but in reality they don't. And the way crops are grown, traditionally destroys all the pasture or certainly all the grassland and pasture and then the sheep or cattle have nothing to eat so they're not ecologically compatible they're financially probably compatible but definitely not ecologically compatible so enterprise stacking need to function that way i go onto onto properties that or meet someone at a workshop then then go onto a property to help them and often they're, they're quite depressed and financially struggling. See, so they know what they're doing in industrial agriculture isn't working. If all your focus in agriculture is about killing things, you can't possibly be cope with that very well mentally. And then you go back to their place five years later and, and they've changed and their whole mental health changed and everything has changed. So that's very rewarding to see, see that happen. Colin's growth as a farmer was born out of an uncontrollable fire that devastated his family and local community, something many farmers experienced in the most recent bushfires of 2019 and 2020. But not all fire has to be this way. Aboriginal cultural burns have existed for thousands of years, and with the recent bushfire tragedy, they've gained more attention as a way of working with nature to manage country.
My name is Lauren Tynan. I'm a Trawalway woman from Tebracuna country, which is the northeast coast of Tasmania. And I currently live down on Darawal Yuan country. And I'm also director of Koori Country Fire Sticks Aboriginal Corporation. Today, in the last couple of days, we've had this amazing opportunity to burn um, National Park and burn here at Yellamundi in a way that um, would have occurred here for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. And so particularly um, for many people here today, you can feel um, that resurgence of, of energy and joy to be able to burn in the way that the ancestors of this place would have burnt for a very long time. So that's using cultural burning principles. Um, and we've done it in very slow little patches, um, we've taken our time, we've broken out into small groups um, and we've also had the most beautiful conditions which um, from an Aboriginal perspective we see that that, um, that ceremony and protocol has been taken care of the right way, the beautiful Dara community and custodians here have welcomed us in and are part of this burn and we would say that the old people are very happy for, for all of us to be here and be doing this burn. If a landholder was reaching out to your organisation, what would you want them to think about first or before they even reach out to you so that they're approaching this in the right way? I think it's having that respect for country and land and I think that is a big part of the reason why landholders do reach out because, you know, if you look at it through that custodianship model, Aboriginal people have been custodians of, of land forever, we, we still are, but in the current model of, of private property, landholders have responsibility as custodians too right and I think that what's really wonderful if I feel that the landholders who have reached out to us so far have that respect for country and that respect for their role in their particular patch and actually extending that invitation out then to those who might hold knowledge that they don't necessarily have and to Aboriginal communities to come to come onto their land and to be caring together and to be reintroducing ways that that land is is known to respond to so I think that that respect and that putting country and land first, which benefits everyone, it benefits the landholder, it benefits country, it benefits the species, it benefits us. And then what's so amazing about that is then all of our relationships together to move forward. We see our role as not coming in and, and doing the burning for the landholders, but it's really about doing it with the landholders. And so there's a lot that um, the landholders are involved in in terms of the preparation beforehand and getting the permit. And, and so in that way too, it's something that really is being, being done together um, rather than a service that we're just coming in and doing, which again is reiterates that point of this is something for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people to do together. Um, and it's something that the landholders are very much a part of because they know their properties they know where they might want to burn and where they might not want to burn. They know that there are certain things they want to protect. And so it's us also respecting, um, respecting that and what they know of that place and then coming in with, um, with different eyes and different knowledges as to how the fire might move and what species take fire and what don't. And that's when the mapping sort of occurs of how it might happen. And we have had landholders approach us and, um, you know, and we've sort of realised that, you know, maybe that property isn't the best for us to burn or there's a lot of work that they're going to need to do before we're able to come in. That's also because we're a very small volunteer organisation and we also don't really have the capacity to do as much as we'd like. Um, but as this movement grows and there's a big national organisation called the Fire Sticks Alliance who are really doing amazing work in this space. Um, and as this grows, then hopefully there'll be more capacity and more communities for cultural burning to be able to take place and for us to fulfil all the requests we get from all the people who are interested. <laughs> I love being a farmhand. Can you just um, cut the engine for a second? So just describe to us where we are now. So we're in the middle of the farm. These paddocks here, as you can see, uh, they're, they're all pretty light leached soils, although this is... We're with new farmer Murray Pryor on his farm called Nuru, located in Gundaroo, about 30 minutes north of Canberra having recently relocated his family from Sydney. And with a CBD resume, Murray has no farming history. Our journey started with a chance book that I was given. In fact, before we moved onto the property, I said to a, a colleague, I don't know much about farming, he said, there's a latest book out, Call of the Reed Warbler. Get it, have a read. So I had a read and it, and it just it just changed my whole life. 
because I was on a destiny to to have a, a farm and you know just do basic farming and then all of a sudden I had this epiphany that what I was about to enter was a much more profound exercise for the family and for the land and and what I had been contemplating was doing things which weren't great for the land and this book really sort of blew my mind in many ways so I, I was lucky enough to to talk to Charlie and, and he, he came out and over about a six month period we worked together to develop a farm master plan and as part of that we talked a lot about native pasture and protecting native grasslands. Now they're not the most nutrient dense grasses for, for cattle or sheep but they are incredibly important ecologically for drought resistance and all those things so, so we decided very early on that we were going to protect native grasslands and build a farm around drought resistance and using techniques that you can build and enhance upon the native ecology rather than you know getting rid of it and starting with exotics so I got into this idea of if we're chemical free avoiding a superphosphate fertilizers and things like that then you've got to find ways to boost the uh, productivity of the farm and so we got straight into to biodynamics and we're on the beginnings of, of, of all of this. Um, this is by a long way not a finished product. Let me show you this. What I want to show you here is a, a cow manure concentrate pit and what we've done is we've taken fresh cow manure and we've added basalt rock dust, crushed eggshell and a bunch of biodynamic preps mixed it all up in a big uh, cement mixer and it's gone in the ground for about nearly five months now and what it does it ferments and it rots down and what we're going to do is make a, a really rich tea out of that and we're going to broad acre spray that over the property um, and that will really you know give it give our soils some vitality it'll boost our native pastures and uh, kick start the farm so let me show you do you need a hand? No, no, we've got we've got four tires holding down a aluminium uh, roofing here. Excellent. So so keep in mind that what went in here was a pretty powerful smelling, pretty green <laughs> mixture. That's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> what I want to show you now is what happens over five months right. is that this turns into an incredible, powerful soil based. And now you have a smell of that. It's just beautiful, sweet yeah, smelling, wow. powerful. Yeah biodynamic fertilizer so before it went in this was really pungent is that what oh, you're yeah. saying <laughs> and it, now it doesn't have that odor at all nothing at all nothing at all so so this will this will go into a into a tea and we'll put it through uh, what they call a flow form to really vitalize that tea and, and oxygenate the the water and then we'll we'll spray it out and that flow form is like a figure eight sort of right. fl flowing of water is that right just yeah. to sort of just get distribute the nutrients distribute, through the water distribute the nutrients uh, oxygenate the water and then there are some spiritual elements to it the, the figure of eight pattern has some meaning in, in the biodynamic theory as well you talked about some of the spiritual elements of it, it sounds a bit mumbo jumbo but is it that some people just aren't open to that or is it really you've just got to be introduced to the ideas sort of step by step yeah it's an excellent question look um, you know I'm the last person to be likely to take this sort of thing up but once you open your mind to a world that's not driven by a chemical solution and you get involved with people in regenerative ag who have in my experience incredible passion and depth of understanding not only of landscape function but of of the meaning of of farming the purpose the higher purpose so that kind of progressed into sort of discussions around all right well you know we all know that the moon has a powerful effect on things like for example shifting oceans twice a day now if it can do that i tend to open my mind to the idea that the moon might have very powerful effects on the rest of life forms and so for me it's just about you know setting aside the the scientific mind and just just allowing yourself to be open to things that frankly I think we we, we just don't simply understand certainly you know um, f uh, forces and energy cycles that exist in in the world above and below the ground th these are things which are frankly beyond our imagination uh, and so 
you kind of have to go with it. Uh, otherwise, you, you cut yourself off to a really big and fascinating part of farming. So we do need to get back to a much more sympathetic and deeper understanding of what we're doing. We're on this beautiful hilltop looking down over the property. Your life was previously in the city. What made the change? We've always wanted to give ourselves and give our kids a different upbringing, a different life to what was on offer in the city. And so we've been looking for a long time. What really changed for us was as we got into regenerative ag, we started to have a really big and higher purpose in what we were doing. And what, what, what sort of drove us towards that was this sense of what would our kids say if they found out we knew and we did nothing about it? And that's for us a big driver because we own this place. We're going to be here in the grand scheme of life in the universe an incredibly short time. What are we going to do to make it a better place in that time that we're here? Agriculture is supposed to be about nurturing the land and that's the major thing that's changed. And what we tend to do is we kill things that want to live and grow things that want to die in, in agriculture. I think a very important way of, of addressing that is we need more women in agriculture. And the reason why we need more women in agriculture is that women are nurturers, instinctively nurturers. So women are really understand this form of agriculture. What I love in the holistic management and regenerative agriculture movement is that so much of it has women at the forefront right now. And it's a lot of women that are saying enough's enough in our families and we want things to change. I would suggest going and attending one of local land services holistic management days and that will give you a taste. But there's so much available on YouTube, on Instagram, Facebook, just Start with the Alan Savory TED Talk and be inspired and, and let things go from there. For Virginia, her inspiration was sparked over 15 years ago. And while she's got plenty of experience under her belt now, she's still learning something new every day. For our farm, we're running so many different enterprises here and you can't possibly know everything about each one. So having other farmers that you can message and say, look, have you seen this? I've seen this happening with my chickens. Have you seen that happening you know, recently? That sort of thing. And people from our holistic management class just came from the most diverse backgrounds. I think our youngest was about 24 and our eldest was a lady in her late 70s. So the diversity there and the skill set and the backgrounds and the careers that they've had just give you access to so much information and different perspectives that you can sort of tap into because we do stay in touch with each other after class. So we have Facebook groups where we can sort of tap in and, and just ask questions and you've just got so many different perspectives coming in within that particular community. One of the big things for me after a, we've run a course is for most of the participants of that course, not always, you can't get everybody, but most of the people to then form a management club or a support group to continue learning. And their success is astounding because they're constantly sharing ideas as a group because once you manage holistically, you realise that the farm boundary isn't actually a boundary. You may be successful, but if your neighbours fail, ultimately you will fail. So once we acknowledge holistic management, it becomes part of you to want everybody to succeed, not just yourself. For a lot of the holistic management farmers, we, want, we just truly believe in, in what we're doing and we want to see more people doing this. And it's about sort of encouraging others to, to step in because we do know that it's going to have a much more positive environmental impact and you know just on 26 acres we're producing so much food for our community imagine if all the little farms in our area were doing the same thing so we're very much about opening up our farm showing people how easy it is we say to people you'll be overwhelmed with our passion and underwhelmed with our infrastructure but it's just about getting people started is the thing that 
that I'm really passionate about. Get them out onto farms, get them trying things and, um, and hopefully we have more regenerative farmers as a consequence. This podcast has been produced by The Grow Love Project on behalf of Greater Sydney Local Land Services through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Thanks to everyone who participated in the making of this episode. You can find out more about them in the show notes. To listen to other episodes, make sure to subscribe to this podcast and if you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Thanks for listening.